Welcome. Today we're going to be taking a look at Edge of Darkness. This is a one to four player card crafting worker placement fantasy game where you take the role of leaders of powerful guilds in the city. This city sits on the border between the Forsaken Lands and the human realm. Monsters and demons are venturing out of the Forsaken Lands to terrorize and paralyze humans. So you will be sending out agents to and from locations to gain resources or abilities and using contacts to resolve effects trying to become the most important guild or the heroes of the city. How do you become the most important guild and win the game? By having the most victory points at the end of the eighth round. Now that we know what the winning condition is, let's take a look at the components set up and how gameplay works in Edge of Darkness. Now let's take a look at the components. This is a Kickstarter edition of the game, so there will be different types of the same component and additional components. First we have the main game board, two optional extension boards, location boards, the threat tower, the threat bag, the round marker in token form and miniature form, the first player marker in token form and miniature form, resource containers, in each of the guild colors, you have the corresponding player boards, agent markers in token form and miniature form, allegiance slips, guild starter cards, defense tokens in plastic and cardboard, player aid tokens in plastic and cardboard, threat cubes in the four player colors, and black. Neutral starter cards, location card advancements, randomizer cards, reference cards, coins in cardboard, plastic, and an additional add-on of metal, reputation tokens in cardboard and plastic, influence and goodwill tokens in cardboard and plastic, card sleeves, score pad, solo reference and solo cards, your solo rulebook, your player handbook, and finally, your rulebook. Now let's take a look at the setup. We're gonna be setting this up for a three player game, which takes 10 steps for your first game and nine for each game after. Step one, for your first game, you will sleeve all starter cards and then place all seven of the allegiance slips for each guild in one sleeve. Step two, place the main board and optional extensions in the center of the play area, and then create coin influence and reputation pools on the main board on their indicated locations. It's good to keep in mind that you do not have to use the optional extension boards if you do not have the room. Step three, choose a guild and get the corresponding player board. Step four, Get player components and starting resources. You will get seven allegiance slips, four guild starter cards, 10 agents, 10 player aid tokens, one defense token, two reference cards, four influence, and five coins. You will place four of your agents on the trained agents location and six to the side of your player board. The allegiance slips and the starter cards you will place next to your player board. Coins and influence will go on their spot on your player board and you'll place your defense token at the top of the defense track. Step five, assemble and place the threat tower. Step six, create the threat pool and draw threat. You're gonna collect the 15 black cubes and then the 15 cubes of each of the player colors involved in this game. You'll place all the cubes in the threat bag and then each player will draw two to place in their threat area. After every player is drawn two threat cubes, four will be drawn and dropped in the tower. Step seven, create your neutral card deck. Based on the number of players, you will create the neutral card deck. If you're playing a two player game, you will discard the cards that have three and four. If you're playing a three player game, you'll discard the cards that have four. And if you're playing a four player game, you will use all of the neutral cards. Step eight, shuffle, draw, and discard your neutral deck. Shuffle the neutral card deck, draw three to place on the threat tower, and then place the rest in the discard location. Step nine, collect and place your location boards and advancements. You will collect 10 location boards and their associated advancements and place the boards above the extension boards and the advancements on the extensions. If you do not have room, you do not have to use the extension boards and you can simply place the advancements on the location boards. For your first game, they do suggest that you use the tail one chapter one on 
on page 6 of your handbook. There are additional options for setup and using randomizer cards for a random setup in the player handbook. And then finally step number 10. Place the round marker and select the first player. You're going to place the round marker on the prologue. And in this case, purple is going to be the first player. Before we jump into the gameplay, the player handbook has a description of all of the actions and abilities of each of the locations and their corresponding advancements. The player handbook also has descriptions and setups based on difficulty level and complexity. Now let's look at the gameplay. A game consists of a prologue and eight rounds. For the prologue, players will draft two advancements to sleeve into their guild starter cards. For the rounds, players will go through an assembly phase and an action phase. At the end of the eighth round, players will go into the final scoring. Now let's take a look at the prologue and rounds in more detail. Starting with the prologue. The prologue is played out in seven steps. Step one, the first player will choose an advancement and sleeve it with one of their starter cards. And then they will resolve the effect on the advancement if they can. The effects you can resolve during the prologue are gain coins, influence, reputation, placing agents, or training agents. So in our game, Purple is the first player. So Purple chose the university professor and paid four coins to train an agent. Step two, the second player chooses, but they cannot choose the same one. You may want to use player aid tokens to help remind or remember which advancements have been chosen. Green chose the treasury officer to gain three coins. And then you will proceed this way until all players have chosen one advancement. The white player chose an advancement that they cannot resolve during the prologue. Step three, in reverse order, choose a second, never repeating an advancement. You may sleeve it on the same card or different cards. And it's good to keep in mind that in a two player game, you will draft three advancements total. Step four, take one advancement from each stack not chosen and then sleeve it on a neutral card and place it back in the discard pile. Step five, each player will place one of their guild starter cards without advancements on their player board and then place the rest in the discard pile. Step six, shuffle the discard pile and place them on the deck location, which is referred to as in the street. Step seven, place the top five cards in the street next to the deck. Then advance the round marker. Now let's look at rounds. Rounds consist of two phases the assembly phase, and the action phase. Now let's look at those phases in detail. Phase one, the assembly phase. You're going to take all of the cards from your guild hall into your hand and collect all of the cubes in your threat zone. It's good to keep in mind that hand size does not matter during this step and that you wanna place those threat cubes next to your cards. Then in turn order, you are going to draft cards from the street until you have three in your hand. So for round one, every player is going to draft two cards from the street. When drafting, you start from the rightmost location in the street, the furthest away from the deck. If you choose to skip a spot when drawing cards, you must pay an influence. It's good to keep in mind that influence will stay on those cards, and when they are finally drafted, they will flip and you will place them in your reputation. and then draw the number of threat cubes from the bag based on the cube icon on all the cards in their hand. So in this case, purple would draw three threat cubes. It's good to keep in mind that when you draw these threat cubes, you place them in your threat zone and they will be dropped in the threat tower in the next round. After a player's drafted cards and drawn cubes, then it goes to the next player and the cards will slide to the right, filling in any empty spots. After all the players have drafted their cards and drawn their cubes, we move to phase two, the action phase. In turn order, players are going to carry out four steps on their turn. Drop threat cubes into the tower, resolve blight attacks, sleeve advancements, use location abilities and resolve effects, and discard cards. Step one, drop cubes into the tower. You are going to drop the cubes that were taken earlier during the assembly phase into the threat tower. The cubes currently in your threat zone will be dropped in the next round. Step two, resolve blight attacks if there are any. A blight attacks when their tray in the threat tower reaches a certain number of cubes. In a four player game, it would be eight or more cubes. In a three player game, it would be seven or more. And then in a two player game, it would be six or more. When that occurs, the player with the most cubes are attacked. If there is a tie, then 
both are attacked. And if black is tied or has the most, every player is attacked. It's good to keep in mind that cards attack as a combination of threats. So you would total the threat on the card. So if that occurred, you would add the damage and then you would reduce the number of damage if the player who was being attacked utilized an advancement or location board that would allow you to do so. It doesn't matter the amount of damage that was left. If there is any damage left, you drop the defense track by one. Then the card is discarded, or if it is owned by a player, it would go into their guild hall, and then you would draw a new blight card from the bottom of the street deck, and then place the cubes that were located in that tray to the side until the threat bag runs out. So in this case, there are no blight attacks. So we move on to step three, sleeve advancement, use abilities, and resolve effects. You must sleeve advancements if you have any. Then you may use abilities of locations and effects from contact cards in your hand. You may do them in any order and they are optional. To use a contact card owned by another player, you must pay one coin for each effect that you are going to use on that card. So if you wanted to use all three, you would have to pay three coins. It's good to keep in mind that you may want to use your player aid tokens to keep track and order of your actions. You will notice symbols on the location and contact cards. All of these symbols are referenced in the rulebook and on your reference cards. The person symbol references agents, an arrow down references placing trained agents on the specific location. An up arrow represents returning trained agents from a specific location. The banner with a person represents training an agent from the side of your board to the trained agent location on your player board. The banner with an arrow represents claiming an allegiance of a neutral card and then sleeving your allegiance slip with that card. The sword symbol represents the battle strength and allows you to attack threats with a higher strength. So you could actually attack the monsters. The swords in black and white represent hunt threats where you are allowed to hunt one or more of the monsters on the threat tower, utilizing your battle strength. When hunting, you would add all of your battle strength and compare it to the damage threat of the monster card. So if you had five battle strength, you could defeat a monster that has five as damage threat or two monsters that have three and two respectively. So if you had five battle strength, you could defeat the monster in the middle and to the right on the threat tower. Then the cards are resolved just like the blight attacks. The card will be discarded, or if it is owned, it would go to their guild hall and the cubes are set to the side. And the player who defeated the monster would gain the reward on that card. You can discard any one card from your hand without resolving any of the effects to get one agent back to your trained agent pool. You can discard two cards from your hand without resolving any of the effects to activate any effect from the street. If that effect is owned by another player, you would pay them one to use that effect. And then step four, discard all the cards in your hand. Neutral cards and cards that you own would go to the discard deck. And if you have another player's card, it would go to their guild hall. Then it would be the next player's turn to carry out their action phase. And then turns would continue until the end of the round. At the end of the round, you're gonna pass the first player marker to the right. You're gonna move the round marker and then begin the next round. Rounds will continue until the end of the eighth round. Then we would go into the final scoring. The final scoring takes nine steps. Step one, the player with the most reputation gets two victory points or each player would get one in a tie. Step two, the player with the most trained agents gets two victory points or if there's a tie, both would get one victory point. Step three, the player with the most guild cards gets two victory points, or if there's a tie, then both players would get one victory point. Step four, the player with the highest defense gets two victory points, or one in a tie. Step five, you will get one victory point per trained agent. Step six, you will get one victory point per reputation that you have. Step seven, you will get one victory point per slot filled on all of your owned guild cards. Step eight, you score victory points based on your current location on your defense track. Step nine, you score one fourth of a victory point per coin, influence, and goodwill that you have. Then you would total your victory points with the tiebreaker being the most guild cards, then the most trained agents, and then the most combined coins and influence, and then the player with the most victory points is the most important guild, the heroes of the city, and wins Edge of Darkness.